Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good morning. Hello. Go ahead and type your name or your nickname into the chat for me. Thank you very much. It's just nine o'clock, so we'll um, we'll let other folks join in as they arrive. So it is Wednesday, and that means today is lecture exam day. Don't forget that. <laughs> Don't forget you have an exam to do today at some point, and submit to me by eight o'clock, um, whenever it fits into your day. Um, I saw that a couple of you uh, got up early and took it, which is great. Remember too, it's out of 80 points and several questions on the exam have to be graded by hand. So the grade that you see when you submit the exam is not right it's it's not um, complete um, i keep reminding you of this because it can be a little startling when you take an exam and you see like a 35 or something <laughs> as your score um, that is not your score that's your partial score i have to go in and, and um, grade the rest of the exam for you so just don't be startled if that happens all right let me see here. All right. So we have um, simple staining on our agenda today. That's our laboratory task ahead of us. Um, we talked about examining living microbes on Monday and basically how to look at microbes without any stain. We talked about making wet mounts and hanging drop slides and using those preparations when we're curious if there's anything swimming around in the sample, if there's anything living in the sample. And if you recall, we said that the reason that we don't stain when we want to know if something is alive in a sample something is swimming, in other words. Um, the reason we don't stain is because stain actually kills cells. And the process that we use in order to create a stained slide actually kills the cells, whatever they happen to be. So what we're gonna start talking about today is those staining processes. Most of what we're examining in terms of microscope slides in the laboratory are stained slides. And we use stains for a couple of different reasons. We, number one, use them because they help us see things better, absolutely. If you remember at the end of our exercise on Monday, I told you that I took a wet mount with my strawberry fungus on it, and I put a little drop of stain at the edge of the cover slip and allowed capillary action to pull that stain under the cover slip. And that gave sort of a bluish color to the whole field under the microscope. And it, the uh, fungal cells that were there were highlighted by that blue stain. So stains are really a lifesaver for us in terms of being able to find and examine um, cells under a microscope. And of course, this is a microbiology class, so we're talking about microbes, but we also use stains when we make preparations of other cell types. For example, if a sample is sent from a patient to a pathology lab, let's say a biopsy sample or some kind of a skin scraping or any other type of cellular sampling, um, the pathologist is also going to stain those cells because a lot more detail can be gathered 
um, especially from a eukaryotic cell, if we use staining. All right, very good. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we jump into the laboratory exercise. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our schedule. That's what you should be seeing on your screen right now. You should be seeing tentative lecture and laboratory schedule. This is just from the syllabus. And remember, you can always access the syllabus from the home page in Canvas. So we have, as of the end of the day today, we have finished this first, this introductory unit. Uh, for the class in terms of the lecture. Uh, intro basically to microbes, a little bit of history, a little bit about microscopy, and of course the cell, which was the topic you've been working on so far this week. Now, looking ahead for us to the next unit, you'll see that we're gonna be talking about prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells and viral particles. So we're taking this topic of the cell and we're diving a little deeper next week. We're gonna separate out prokaryotic microbes and eukaryotic microbes. And we're gonna really talk in a little more depth about them and their features, their cellular structural features. And then we'll be talking a little bit about the viruses, the acellular microbes. This lecture um, is going to also introduce us to this concept of prions or prions, which are a special type of, again, non-living um, entity that can cause disease in humans. The majority of this lecture though is about the viruses because in microbiology, the viruses are of special interest to us because they cause so much disease. So um, that's what we have moving forward. Next week in lab, we're going to be starting to talk about specific techniques um, that are a little bit more complex than the techniques we talked about this week. Next week, we're going to talk about the single most common staining technique that's used in the microbiology lab, which is gram staining. And then on Wednesday next week, we're gonna talk about aseptic technique. We're gonna talk about all the little things that we do in the microbiology lab to prevent sepsis or contamination of our materials. So aseptic, without sepsis, that's what that word is referring to. And there are lots and lots of little tricks and techniques that we use in the lab in order to do that. One of those key things we've talked about, which is not contaminating our samples. <laughs> so that'll be coming up next week. I also want to just take a minute to um, talk about something else that is available to you in the modules, in the course materials modules just in case you haven't had a, a moment to look at it yet. Give me just a sec here. And that's this document called the Instructor Interaction Plan. Um, in that course materials module, that very first module in Canvas, there's a short document called the, I think it's the Instructor Student Interaction Plan. And all it is is a list for you of how I manage all of the communications that go on in, in the course, things like answering email, um, grading exams versus grading quizzes and things like that. And it gives you a sense of how long it takes me to do things. So um, it's a little bit different in the summer because um, in the summer I tend to have a lighter course load, but um, especially during the semesters, I always wanna communicate with students what to expect. Um, the, 
I don't, for example, have my email, my uh, River Valley email open all day long because I have to respond to emails from different colleges and everybody uses the same email system, the Outlook system. So I can't be logged in to three different schools all at the same time. So I check in with my email at certain times during the day. Now, what that means is if you shoot me an email at noon, I may not get it until that evening. Or if you shoot me an email in the evening, I may not get it till the next day. So I really encourage you to take a look at the instructor interaction plan um, in order to um, just get a sense of, of how I manage communications. Um, it also talks a little bit about grading and how long it generally takes me to get things back to you, um, just so you're not wondering and waiting about things. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this instructor interaction plan. And that's what you should be seeing on your screen right now. Let me scroll up to the top. So this is what it looks like when you click on that link on our homepage. You can see there's a little bit about announcements, um, email again, when I check my email, how long it takes me to respond, um, a little bit about appointments over Zoom, discussion boards, um, assignment feedback, things like that, and how long you know it typically takes me to get things back to you. So this document is there for you. Um, if you ever have a question about you know, why perhaps I haven't responded to you. You sent me an email, you haven't heard back from me. Um, I will say this, and this is a this is an important statement and, and a very general statement across all aspects of the course. If you try to get up with me, if you message me and you, you haven't heard back from me in say 24 hours, um, please don't hesitate to send me another message. Um, it's perfectly polite and professional to send an email to somebody and say, um, I sent you a message and I haven't heard back from you. So I thought I would try again, or I thought I would contact you again. There's nothing impolite about that. Um, in the professional world, we do it all the time. And we do it because we recognize how busy we all are. And we recognize that sometimes emails get lost. If you get uh, into a professional job, you will find that you get lots and lots and lots and lots of email every day. And you have to sort of know how to prioritize who to respond to first. So don't hesitate. If I haven't responded to you in the amount of time that is, you know, talked about in that instructor interaction plan. Don't hesitate to send me a message. Um, I would ask that you be polite. <laughs> I have, every once in a while I'll get um, an angry email from a student, but um, um, it's always good to practice your polite professional email manners while you're in a, a course like this. Um, because of course, in your professional life, you will be expected to um, adhere to certain rules of decorum when you're on email. So I'm just joking, of course. Um, all right. So I've got a couple messages in chat. Um, Connie's asking about notes. I, I, I have gotten this question before, Connie. Um, a lot of us, of course, take our notes on the computer now. Um, as I said uh, earlier in the course, I said um, some students actually will pull up the PowerPoint slides that I provide for you, and they will take notes directly on the slides. Um, if that's the case, if you have um, your notes on your computer and not on paper, in other words, you can do one of two things. You can either print out your notes if you find that helpful, or you can toggle. You can open up your notes and you can open up the exam 
on your desktop in two different windows and you can toggle back and forth. Um, that's not a problem. You are not on the Respondus monitor right now in this course. Um, if you've taken other courses at River Valley, you, you may have experienced being recorded through Respondus while you're taking an exam. Um, and Respondus locks down your browser while you're taking um, exams. So you can't toggle. But in this class, you can. Um, again, you are completely on your honor in this class not to do things you're not supposed to do during the exam. So yeah, don't feel like you have to print out your notes. Some students like to print out their notes because they like a hard copy. Um, so it's totally up to you, Connie, and anyone else um, if you want to toggle back and forth with your notes during the exam. Um, <laughs> Elaine, I'm so sorry. You had an accident with your coffee. I've done it. I My have space filled. bar isn't working now. I think oh, I'm, I'm going to turn the it. computer upside down and see if it'll help. Yes. I have a fan running. So yeah. I'm going to turn my video off so I'm not looking upside down and weird. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. I have spilled coffee on, I think, every device I own. And um, my son keeps gently reminding me that I might not want to have my coffee next to my devices. <laughs> so I understand that problem. All right. Oh, and um, and regarding how fast I talk, yes, thank you. Um, I will say from um, from having the benefit of lots of experience in the classroom, because uh, I've been teaching now for gosh, uh, thirteen years maybe. Um, I've learned uh, what pace seems to work well while I lecture, so that students can take notes. Um, like you. I have been in the classroom. I was in the classroom a lot when I was your age because, you know, I, I went to veterinary school after college and I've had a lot of professors in my life. And I, I learned what I liked about certain professors and what I didn't like about certain professors. And I tried to adopt um, a style for myself. Now, I will say some students find my pace in the lecture videos annoying. They think I go too slow. Remember that one of the benefits of YouTube, if you didn't know this, is you can adjust the playback speed in YouTube. Yeah, if, if you ever um, want to make a video go a little faster, you can do that. You can go into the controls and you can select 1.25 or 1.5 playback speed. So every once in a while, I'll get a message from a student. Oh, your lectures are so slow. It's too hard to watch. You speak so slowly. And I'm like, you know, you can speed that up a little bit if you want. But I hope that what it's doing is it's giving you time enough to be taking down notes as we go. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate the compliment because uh, that's really what it's all about, right? It's all about, in this course anyway, it's all about taking notes and, and learning how to take a really good set of notes for yourself because you'll have access to those notes during the exam. All right, very good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up our uh, lab slides and we'll get started on today's exercise. That's what you should be seeing on your screen right now. You should be seeing the title slide that says simple staining. So our objectives for this exercise today are to first just talk a little bit about staining. We're gonna learn some new vocabulary around staining processes and types of stains. And we're going to talk a little bit about how staining works. In the second part of the exercise, we're going to actually prepare a, a slide, a microscope slide. We're going to prepare what we call a smear of bacteria. We're going to heat fix it. We're going to go through a simple direct staining procedure. And again, that's part of our new vocabulary. 
And then we'll take that slide to the microscope. We'll take a look and we will um, examine several slides that have different shapes of bacterial cells on them. So we can start practicing identifying the cell shape that we see in front of us. So you heard me use this term smear. In microbiology, when we talk about a smear, we're talking about a thin layer of microbial cells that we have placed onto a microscope slide. The key term in that definition is this term thin. One of the greatest challenges when you're first learning how to make a smear on a slide is learning how to get it thin enough. Remember that the light microscope has some limitations in terms of what it can show us. And one of the limitations is it's very difficult to view things under the microscope if, they're in, if there are multiple layers of cells sitting on top of each other, in other words. So we try really hard to make our smears nice and thin so that we have individual cells to see on the slide. The other term you're gonna hear me say a lot today is fixation. Fixation is simply a process where we are doing something to the cells in the smear to help them adhere to the slide. Now, if you remember, I said that staining kills cells and fixation too kills cells. So we're kind of hitting cells with a double whammy when we stain. We're fixing them and killing them, and then we're staining them and killing them. So <laughs> there's two opportunities to uh, kill cells uh, when we are making these types of slides. Now we're gonna talk about two methods of fixation. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about heat fixation because in my experience, that's the most commonly used method in the microbiology lab. It's quite easy to do heat fixation. It does take a little bit of practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's very fast and simple. But it is possible to, heat, uh, to fix a smear to a slide by using a chemical process instead we can use methanol, specifically methanol, at a dilution of 95%. We simply apply the methanol on top of the smear and the methanol will cause the cells to adhere to the slide as it dries. So again, we're gonna speak primarily about heat fixation in this class because that's the method that I think is used in most microbiology labs. Now, what's happening when we fix a smear like this? What's happening is the heat and the methanol, doesn't matter which method you're using, are gonna cause the protein that's in the cell membrane to coagulate you're gonna cause it to change its shape and change its nature by applying heat. When the proteins coagulate, they get sticky. And what'll happen is that stickiness will adhere the cell to that glass slide. Now, something else also happens during fixation that we don't talk about very much, but it is a good thing to understand Part of the reason that fixation kills is because it's also coagulating and denaturing the proteins inside the cell, particularly the enzymes inside the cell. And that's important because it's inactivating those enzymes. So those cells, like all cells, are full of enzymes. And remember, all an enzyme is, is a protein that's capable of catalyzing a chemical reaction. So some of the chemical reactions that occur in a microbial cell that is um, going through fixation is 
those enzymes start to break the cell down. Those enzymes actually start to destroy the structures within the cell. It's the same sort of process that goes on after a human dies, this process called autolysis. This is the word right here, auto meaning self and lysis meaning break apart or break down. So just like humans do after we die, cell uh, or after we're um, going through the process of death, um, enzymes inside microbial cells also start to break things down. Um, and by denaturing them or um, inactivating them, we're going to prevent that from happening. And that's important because we want the, the internal architecture of the cells to be kept intact. We don't want it to turn into mush, in other words, as we're fixing those cells. So yes, we mostly talk about fixation in terms of its ability to cause the proteins to stick to the slide. That's really important because we need the cells to adhere to the slide so we don't just wash them off while we're staining the cells. But we should always remember that another thing that fixation does is it helps prevent the cell uh, innards, the internal parts of the cell from breaking down. Now, the process of heat fixation is very simple, but it does take a little practice. All you have to do is take the smear that has been allowed to dry. So this nice thin layer of cells that has been spread out onto the slide, we allow it to dry. And then we pass that layer through an open flame, maybe three or four times, just back and forth through the open flame. Now, some laboratories don't have open flame sources in them. I know that seems a little strange. If you've ever been in a chemistry lab, you know, Bunsen burners are very popular. You will find in some microbiology labs that there are Bunsen burners and they're being used to heat fix smears. But some laboratories have gone away from Bunsen burners because they just don't need them because you can heat fix a smear using an incinerator. Now we'll, get, we'll take a look at incinerators in just a minute. Um, an incinerator device in a microbiology lab simply sits on the de desktop and it allows us to sterilize that loop, that inoculating loop that we talked about last time. These incinerators get very hot. They have a metal housing around them that also gets hot. And we can simply press our smear against that housing for about 20 to 30 seconds, and that will achieve fixation. So you can do it with an open flame and you can do it with an incinerator device. Um, you're just applying the heat for a short period of time. Now, the reason I said it takes a little practice to learn how to heat fix is because you can do it for too short of an amount of time. That will allow the cells to be washed off the slide when you apply your stain. You can also heat fix for too long of a time, and that will simply burn up the cells on the slide. So in either case, if you heat fix for too short a time or too long a time, what's gonna happen is when you take your slide under the microscope, the cells are gonna be gone. So the key point is the timing of heat fixation. One other thing to note at the bottom of the slide, it says only fix dry smears in big capital letters. <laughs> um, this is a biosafety issue. When we smear cells onto the surface of a slide, we need to allow them to dry. Now remember, this is before we heat fix them, okay? The reason it's so important that you don't take a wet smear 
to heat fix is because that heat is going to cause that liquid on the slide to vaporize. It's a very small amount of liquid. And what will happen is it will simply vaporize up into the air and it will carry the cells with it. So if you try to heat fix a wet slide, what you will do accidentally is send microbial cells up into the air. Now, yes, there are microbes all around us. There are microbes in the air all the time, but you may be working with a potential pathogen. And the last thing you wanna do is send a pathogen up into the air in your laboratory. It's dangerous to you and it's dangerous to your colleagues. So we always let smears dry completely before we heat fix them. All right. And again, I'll show you this. I will show you um, some video of this process in just a couple of minutes. There's a couple of images on this slide that are related to heat fixation. At the bottom, you can see a slide being placed over an open flame, a Bunsen burner flame. Notice that the person who's doing this is holding the slide with a pair of hemostats. That's very common. You can also use a simple wooden clothespin to do this. Obviously, what you're doing is you're keeping your fingers away from the open flame. Um, in my experience, in a lot of microbiology labs, people just buy inexpensive wooden uh, clothespins. Um, if you've never seen a clothespin, I'll show you one in just a minute. But a pair of hemostats would also do the trick. The idea is you want to hold the slide over the flame, but you want to keep your fingers away from the flame. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is, if you recall from chemistry, this is a nice blue flame. You don't want your flame to be orange because believe it or not, the, the orange flame is less hot than the blue flame is. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is that there's this larger flame here, and then within that, there's a cone right here, almost a triangle right here. Also blue, but a slightly different shade of blue. Let's see if I can enlarge this for you. So there's a flame inside of the flame. That inner blue cone is the hottest part of the flame. And what you want to do is place your slide over the top of that inner blue cone. Now, this is a two dimensional still image. <laughs> so, obviously, when you're heat fixing, you would never put a slide over the flame and then just leave it there because what'll happen is you'll burn up your smear. What you're going to do is you're just going to pass it across the flame right over the tip of that inner blue cone. You're just gonna pass it once, then twice, then three, and maybe four, and then you're done. That's all you need to do. That's enough heat to cause those proteins to get sticky and adhere to the slide. Now up at the top here, you're looking at this black tray that is sitting on a cart in a laboratory. This is called a slide warmer. And like the name suggests, the purpose of this little black tray is to help smears dry more quickly than they would if they were just left in the air to dry. So these trays are kept in the lab at a nice warm temperature. You lay the slide out on the warmer after you make the smear and it will help the smear dry. Now the slide warmer is not going to fix the cells. All it's doing is helping the smear to dry. So you still have to pass that slide through the flame, or as I said, apply a drop of methanol to the smear and let the methanol dry. 
um, you've still got to do your heat fixing after you um, dry a slide on a slide warmer. So a lot of what's happening every day in the microbiology lab is people are taking um, either pure cultures of microbes. Remember by culture, we mean a collection of cells that are being purposefully grown in the laboratory, or they're taking a patient sample that they think might have microbes in it. They're picking up a few of those cells and they are um, placing them onto a, a glass microscope slide. That creates that smear. If we're gonna stain the smear, we need to heat fix the smear or chemical fix it, as I said. Once the fixation is done, we're ready for staining. Now, there's a couple things we need to know about these stains, just generally speaking, because there are many, many microbiology stains in use. Different stains have different purposes in the microbiology lab. There will be stains that are used for one thing, There'll be um, stains that are only used on certain organisms. There'll be stains that are combined. Um, there are lots of stains used in the lab every day. So a couple of facts about stains. Stains, when we, we refer to them as stains, but really what we're dealing with are what most people would think of as a dye. So this is very similar to the dyes that are used to put color into all kinds of objects in our lives, like textiles and things. These microbiology stains, like most dyes, are made out of salts. Now, all a salt is, if you remember from chemistry, all a salt is, is a molecule that's made out of two ions that are brought together through ionic bonding. So for example, we all think of sodium chloride when we think of salt, that's table salt. Sodium chloride is simply sodium ion and chloride ion coming together and um, binding to each other with an ionic bond to create this salt. And of course, when you put a salt into water, it dissolves, it separates back out into the ions. Now, what makes a stain different from other salts is that the ions have color associated with them. The scientific term for that is a chromophore. Whenever you see this term chromo, this means color. So a chromophore or a colored ion. Now there are two general forms of chromophore. There's a positive chromophore and there's a negative chromophore. So it depends on the charge on the ion. Positive chromophores create what we call basic stains. And this word basic is referring to pH. Negative chromophores create what we call acidic stains. Most, most bacterial stains that we use in the micro lab are basic stains. So they contain a positive chromophore. And the reason we use basic stains most often is because they're going to be able to permeate through the peptidoglycan cell wall of the bacterial cell and bind with the membrane because membranes have a net negative charge. Now, if you remember in the cell lecture, we said, or I guess might've been in the intro lecture, I can't quite remember. We said that inside of a cell's membrane, there's really equal amounts of phospholipid and protein. Membranes are packed with proteins. It's the proteins that have a net negative charge associated with them. So when those basic stains, those positive chromophores pass through the peptidoglycan, 
and they meet the membrane, they're, they're going to be able to bind to the membrane because of that net negative charge. So they're, they're bound there, they're attached there now, and they're going to impart their color to the cell now. So whatever color that chromophore has associated with it is now going to be the color that the cell appears to be under the microscope. Now, just as there are lots and lots and lots of different stains that are used in the lab, there are also many different staining procedures or staining protocols that we use. You can break those protocols down into two groups. The first type of protocol or procedure is called simple staining. And the second kind is called differential staining. Simple staining, like the name suggests, is the more simple procedure. And that's because it uses only one stain. So we're gonna be applying one stain to our cells. And that means they're gonna pick up one color. Now, within this type of staining, this simple staining, there are actually categories. There's, there's what we refer to as simple direct staining and simple negative staining. A direct staining process is going to stain the cells. Most simple staining is simple direct staining. Let me say that again. Most simple staining where we use only one stain is simple direct staining. We're gonna apply that one stain and it's going to stain the cells a certain color. There is a process though that you should be familiar with called simple negative staining. And what that process does is it stains the background it does not stain the cells. It stains the background in the smear. And there are times when we want to do that because it helps us see certain features of cells differently than if we tried to stain the cell itself. We're going to be looking at a simple direct staining procedure today. Now, the other big category of staining procedures is differential staining. And what differential staining involves is using multiple stains. We don't apply them all at once, but essentially what we do is we apply different stains in, in a sequence. So we'll apply one stain and then we'll wash that off. We'll apply a second stain and wash that off and so on. What differential staining allows us to do is uh, produce a stained cell that has different colors in it. And the different colors are going to highlight different structures. Differential staining, in other words, uses a series of stains that stick to different types of molecules. Differential staining is especially useful in eukaryotic cells, although we do use it in bacteria and archaea as well. But you can imagine in a eukaryotic microbe, because it's a eukaryote, there are organelles in there. And differential staining helps us see those organelles. It might stain the membrane one color and it will stain the nucleus another color and it might stain um, lipid material a third color and so on. So it's especially helpful when you're looking at eukaryotic microbes but we do use differential staining with bacteria as well. 
Now, a good example of a simple stain is the one we're gonna be using today, which is called methylene blue. Methylene blue is a very commonly used stain in the micro lab. Like most microbial stains, it's a positive chromophore, so it's a basic stain. And it's also a direct stain, so it's gonna stain the cells. And like the name suggests, it has a lovely blue color to it. All right. Questions? Any questions so far about this terminology that we're using? So you're gonna hear me talk about smears all semester long. I'm just going to refer to them as smears. And now you know what a smear is. It's just a thin layer of cells that have been applied to a microscope slide. And we'll talk about fixing smears and we'll talk about staining smears. Um, and now you have that vocabulary. So it will uh, make more sense to you, hopefully. Okay. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video together that uh, walks us through a simple staining procedure. So before I start the video, I just want us to take a look at this container. This is um, a very popular type of uh, squeeze bottle container that you might see in a laboratory space. All you have to do is give this the body of this bottle a little squeeze and you're gonna squirt out whatever's inside through this nozzle here. So rather than having a trigger spray bottle, you know, um, you'll often find these in labs. And this is a, the, a bottle that would be used for daily disinfecting. Remember when we come into the lab, the very first thing we're gonna do each morning is disinfect our workspace. So the other thing I wanted to show you on this is this um, hazard symbol that we talked about. So remember, this is a universal symbol, this diamond, this NFPA diamond. Remember this red box tells us the, the fire hazard associated with what's inside this bottle. So yes, we put that, we put a diamond on the door of a laboratory to tell us about everything that's inside that lab. What's the highest level of hazard inside that lab? But you can also put a diamond on each individual container of chemical in your laboratory. In fact, when you purchase laboratory supplies, they're gonna arrive from a Sigma or from any other chemical supplier that you use they're gonna arrive in a bottle that has a diamond on it. And it's telling you what the hazards are associated with that chemical. And again, it's important to understand those diamonds because you're the person, if you're handling that material, you are the person who is being exposed to those risks. So it really is in your best interest, in your job, to know what you're handling so you can take appropriate precautions. So if you look at the diamond for ethanol, and that's what's in this bottle, plain old ethanol for disinfection, it has the number three in the fire hazard box, right? Um, that's high, that's three out of four. If you didn't already know, alcohol is very flammable. So you would never want to squirt alcohol out of this bottle near an open flame. There's no special hazard down here. See that box is just blank. Remember the white box is for very unique special hazards. The other number, this is just a zero here, but the two over here, remember, is for health. So two out of four, there's health hazards associated with ethanol. Hopefully I'm not the first person who's telling you that ethanol is not exactly good for your health. Um, obviously we don't consume the ethanol out of that bottle. <laughs> Hopefully no one's doing that. 
but um, ethanol does have health hazards associated with it. So again, you would just wanna be aware of that if you're handling ethanol in your job every day. Um, I heard a terrible story in the news uh, yesterday or perhaps the day before, um, just breaks my heart. Um, apparently a young lady, a teenage girl um, was, um, I don't even know how to say this, but she was um, copying some sort of a trend that she saw on TikTok. And again, I don't know anything about it, but I know that what she did was she sprayed alcohol onto the mirror in the bathroom and then she set it on fire. And this is somehow some new trend on TikTok. Um, what happened was she set herself on fire because she had ethanol on her hands um, or, or isopropyl alcohol or whatever alcohol that her family had in the medicine cabinet. She set her hair on fire and she set her clothing on fire and she started to scream and her poor mother came into the room and found her a flame. And that poor girl is now in the ICU with very severe burns because she didn't know that alcohol was that dangerous to her. Um, so um, never assume that people understand the dangers of the chemicals that are around us every day because a whole lot of people don't. Um, the idea that you would ever purposefully put a lit match to a puddle of alcohol is just startling to me. But again, you know, she was just a teenager. She just didn't understand that. So unfortunately she's suffering the consequences now. All right, so there's my little biosafety piece for the morning. I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, start this video for us. Sorry. Sorry. Our work in the laboratory, remember that we have to disinfect the work surface. The two most common disinfectants used in laboratories for this kind of disinfection are alcohol and bleach. We use an alcohol solution of anywhere from 60 to 90 percent. Typically it's about 70 percent. And we use a 10 percent bleach solution. Both of those things are rapidly bactericidal. They will kill bacteria on surfaces very quickly. And that's why they're so effective. So with a squirt bottle like this, we simply um, apply the disinfectant to the surface and then clean it off. Make sure the surface is nice and dry before you get yourself going with your work. Remember too that you have to make sure you have all of your materials gathered before you begin. And first and foremost, we want to glove up. Um, these are nitrile gloves that I'm wearing in this picture. Um, I put this picture in because I want you to see that these gloves are a little too big for my hands. You want to wear gloves in the laboratory that are not too tight or too loose. And generally speaking, when you look at the back of your hand, which is what you're looking at in this picture, you should be able to move your fingers and your thumb around and not get these very large um, folds. You don't want the glove to have a lot of extra space. You want it to fit against your skin, but you don't want to wear a tight glove. It's not good, it will cut off your circulation. Um, on the palm side of my hand, you can see there's just a, there's a lot of extra room in this glove. You can see the folds. Um, on my palm and along my fingers. But um, unfortunately, beggars can't be choosers. And right now, this is the only size glove that I have available. Okay, so I've gathered the supplies that we're going to need today in order to make a smear of bacteria for staining. And what you're seeing on the desktop here, 
I've got a bowl um, that is used only for staining purposes. Uh, I've got a dropper bottle with methylene blue in it, which is a very commonly used simple stain. I've got a, um, a clothespin here, and uh, I'll show you what we do with those while we're staining. I've also got my inoculation loop. Uh, this is an instrument that we use very often in the microbiology lab. It has an aluminum handle, and then it has a wire. And at the end of the wire, you can't really see it here, but at the end of the wire, there's a loop. Um, when you dip this wire into a culture, into a broth culture, you will pull up some of that culture within the loop. If you remember when you were a little kid and you used to play with soap bubbles, you would stick that little wand down into the soap bubble solution and you would pick up some of the solution inside the loop. And that's what we're doing uh, with an inoculating loop as well. Over on the right hand side over here, you can see an incinerator. This is an electric device that gets hot enough to allow us to uh, sterilize the wire on an inoculating loop. Now in this test tube I'm holding um, a nutrient broth culture. Um, it has bacteria growing in it so I would have just pulled this out of the incubator and I'm now ready to examine cells that are inside the culture. Anytime you pull a broth culture out of the incubator, one of the indications that you have been successful in growing bacteria is the cloudiness that you see in the broth solution. The broth starts off very clear. You would be able to um, hold a, a piece of paper behind it and read the writing on the paper. Um, but obviously, this solution is no longer clear um, because it has cells growing in it. Now, it's really important that when you're using an incinerator in a microbiology lab, that you go ahead right at the start of your day and plug that thing in. These do take a few minutes to warm up, and they have to be red hot in order to work correctly. So I always plug the incinerator in right away when I get into the lab and I'm ready to start making slides. Note too that a lot of incinerators have two settings. They've got a low heat setting and a high heat setting. Now I happen to be using the high heat setting today, but uh, depending on the incinerator, the low heat setting might be just fine. Um, incinerators can get very hot. And sometimes having the incinerator on the desktop on high is just unbearable because it's radiating so much heat that it's making you hot sitting, you know, two and three feet away from it. So um, the reason the low setting is there is because some incinerators will get plenty hot on the low setting. So when we're ready to sterilize the loop, it's the wire portion of the loop and not the aluminum handle that we're going to be putting into the incinerator. You can see that there is a metal plate on the front of the incinerator, and then there's a ceramic tube that runs down into the device. Um, we're going to place the wire as far as it will go down into that tube for the purposes of sterilization. This, um, this picture is very blurry because I wanted to uh, focus in on the loop as it sits way down in the back of the incinerator. You can see that the ceramic surface actually will glow red hot when the incinerator is ready to go. And the wire, at least the end of the wire, where the loop is, is also glowing red hot. You need to achieve that in order to achieve sterilization. You've got to get that metal red hot. Now, as soon as you withdraw the inoculating loop from the incinerator, your, the red hot color of the metal is going to go away. It's going to go right back to its regular color, but understand that this wire is burning hot right now. So the very last thing you would want to do is take this loop at this moment and put it into your broth culture. 
because you will sizzle that broth culture and you'll kill a whole lot of bacterial cells. So instead, you just hold the loop in your hand and count to about 20. Just do a little mental count in your head to about 20. That's enough time for that loop to cool off um, to be safe to put into your culture solution. So remember, when it's time to take out the culture solution with our inoculating loop, we want to make sure that we're handling the culture tube correctly. Remember, always with a gloved hand, we don't handle any culture materials with our bare hands. And we're going to always remember, once we open a container that has pure culture on it or in it, we want to tilt it so we make sure not to allow any microbes to accidentally fall in. When you take the cap off, you want to keep the cap in your fingers. Don't put it down on the desktop. Um, you're going to keep the tube at an angle while you draw out your specimen. You can see I've got the loop here. Um, I'm not just sticking the loop right under the um, surface of the liquid. I'm going down about halfway into the tube. Um, that's just good practice. It's also good practice not to allow the handle of the inoculating loop to get too far into that tube. And that's because, if you recall, we didn't sterilize this handle. We sterilized the wire, or at least the bottom half of the wire. So try not to put any more of that handle into your culture tube than absolutely necessary. Right. Once you have culture on your inoculating loop, you can place that culture onto your glass slide and you'll see I'm doing circle movements getting ever wider and basically spreading that liquid out across the center third of the microscope slide. Of course we have to let the culture material dry and all I've done here is I've set the slide down on a piece of paper towel. Um, notice that the slide is labeled um, Typically, when you're making a slide that you're, you plan on just looking at and then throwing away, um, the labeling is not important. But if you're making multiple slides, which is often what you're doing, you're going to want to label them. And certainly, if you want to save the slide, if you're going to produce and stain a slide and you want to save it, you're going to want to label it. So I have my initials. I have the date that the slide was made. I have the name of the organism that's growing in my culture, and that is uh, capital B for the genus Bacillus, and the species name is Subtilis. Um, and then finally, I wrote MB on this slide because I'm going to be using methylene blue as my stain. The next step in preparing a smear for staining is critically important. That step is called heat fixation. We're doing a couple things when we heat fix a smear of bacteria or other microbes. Number one, we're going to warm up the surface of the slide so that the lipid in the membrane of those cells will stick to the surface of the slide. This is such an important step and unfortunately sometimes it gets overlooked. If you try to stain a bacterial smear that has not been heat fixed, when you go to stain that smear, you're gonna wash the cells right off the slide. So we heat fix to adhere the cells to the slide. We also heat fix to kill the cells. Now the stain, the staining procedure, the stain itself is gonna kill the cells too. So it's kind of a double check that we've got the cells um, killed and stuck to our slide. Now, one other thing to know about heat fixing, and that's this. You never heat fix your slide until it's dry. So once you put your bacterial cells onto your slide and spread them out, you've got to allow that slide to dry completely before you heat fix it. And that's because if you lay a damp slide, a wet slide, against this hot incinerator like this, you run the risk that you're going to aerosolize that liquid very quickly, and you're going to send bacteria up into the air. 
and you don't want to do that. So make sure the slide is 100% dry and then pick the slide up, uh, preferably with a clothespin. And this is the clothespin I showed you at the beginning of the video this morning. Um, the clothespin will allow me to hold this slide against the hot aluminum surface of my incinerator and keep my fingers far away. <laughs> so you simply lay the glass slide right to the surface of that incinerator and leave it there for approximately 20 to 30 seconds. Once your slide is heat fixed, it's time to apply the stain. I'm applying a drop of methylene blue, again, to the center of the slide, because I know that's where I placed my cells. Now, don't be stingy with stain. <laughs> you want to make sure that that whole smear that you took the time and trouble to make is covered with that stain. So put the stain onto the slide so that it makes a nice puddle, all right? Stain is not expensive. So go ahead and apply it generously. And that way you're ensured that all of the cells will get exposed to that stain. Typically when we're doing a simple staining procedure like this one where we're applying that one stain and then we're gonna rinse it off, it will stay on the slide for about 60 seconds. Now every stain is a little bit different and sometimes uh, it'll be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, um, but generally it takes about a minute to stain a smear like this. Once that time is up, you get your stain waste container like that bowl I showed you a minute ago. You're gonna take that container, you're gonna hold your slide over it, and you're just gently gonna rinse the excess stain off of the slide. Now, notice you don't see a big blue area on my slide, even though it's been stained. You're not staining the slide, you're staining the cells on the slide, and you're not gonna see where those cells are until you put that slide under the microscope. Once it's rinsed, you can allow the slide to dry. Just one more word about stain. All of the stains that we use in the microbiology laboratory have to be disposed of correctly. They have to be collected into a waste container and treated as hazardous waste. So the reason that we work in these containers, these stain bowls or staining trays, is because we want to be able to collect this waste stain and keep it from going down the drain. You can allow the slide to just air dry, but you can also use this material here, which is called bilbis paper. This paper is just a, it's a thick absorbent piece of paper and it comes in um, pads. So you use one of these pieces to just blot your damp slide um, and get it prepared for observation under the microscope. All I've done here is folded the bilbis paper over and I'm just going to gently press it down onto the surface of the slide so that I wick up as much of that moisture as possible. It's important to know that you don't have to get a microscope slide completely dry after you've stained it. Um, if it's a little bit damp, that's not a problem. You don't want to rub the slide. You just want to blot it gently. You're trying to get up as much of the excess moisture as you can before you examine it. All right. Very good. So very simple procedure. We're going to take some cells out of a container. It might be a culture. In other words, a container where we are purposefully growing microbes or a pure culture of microbes. We might be taking it from a sample that was sent to the lab that was gathered from a patient. We're gonna put cells onto a slide. We're gonna make a smear. We're gonna fix the smear. 
and we stained it using a simple direct stain. We're going to keep all of our waste stain because we want that to be treated like hazardous waste. It never goes down the drain. Okay. Couple of questions here we have. How hot does the incinerator get? The incinerator, I, I can't give you uh, an exact temperature for the incinerator, but I can tell you that uh, it will burn you badly if you touch it. <laughs> so that's why we use the clothespins. Um, you don't wanna put your fingers, your hands near a hot incinerator. It's hot enough to burn you badly. Um, it, it's red hot. That ceramic tube in there is hot enough to make that metal glow red hot within a short period of time. So um, they are nice in that they take away the dangers of an open flame, but it's this hot device sitting on your desktop. And so you have to be careful with them. You don't wanna um, accidentally bump into them and burn yourself. And like I said in the video, they radiate heat. So, um, you know, if you're making a lot of slides and you have to have your incinerator on for a couple of hours, perhaps, um, it can make you uncomfortably hot just sitting near it. That's how hot it gets. All right. So Elaine is asking um, how long we leave stains on. Uh, two things to know, every stain has its own instructions for use. Um, and those are actually available to you um, on the container of the stain. Um, generally speaking, it takes about a minute to stain cells. So there will be some stains that we leave on for shorter than a minute, and there'll be some you leave on longer than a minute, but for a lot of them, 60 seconds is, is a good uh, time to keep in your head for staining. <laughs> That's right, thanks for, uh, thanks for answering that question, Karen. All right, very good. All right, well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at some smears and see what we can see. All right. Eey, here we go. So this is a stained smear of the cells that I mentioned in the video. This is an organism called Bacillus subtilis. Um, and like the name suggests, Bacillus, this is a rod shaped organism. Now, when you look, everything that you see that's this purple blue color is one of the bacterial cells. So again, it's a direct stain, a simple direct stain. So the background is gonna stay white and the cells are gonna pick up the color. Now, I want you to notice that as you look around, as you jump from like cell to cell to cell, a lot of the time you're actually looking at more than one. They're essentially joining up into chains a lot of the time. So for example, this thing that I'm pointing at right here, this is not one cell. This is a couple of cells that have gotten into a chain formation, head to tail, head to tail. So one of the things that I always tell students I recommend to do when you first look under the microscope at a smear is sort of do a survey all across the smear and see if you can find a single cell. So if you take your eyes down right here, for example, that looks like one cell. Here's another single cell right here. Notice that the cell has an elongated shape. So this is a rod or a bacillus, this organism. I'm also gonna try to see, here's a good example right here. Here's a chain of three cells. There's one right here. There's one here and there's one here. You can just see just the tiniest sliver of white 
in between those cells. One, two, three. They have joined up together in a chain. This is a behavior that some bacteria have when we make these smears. Some bacteria clump up together. Some bacteria get into chains. Some bacteria don't have any special arrangement that they make. But it is something that we note when we examine a smear because it can be characteristic for a particular organism. Now, one thing I have not said is what power we are looking at here. We are examining these cells under the 100X oil immersion lens. So we are at a thousand X total magnification. Now I want you to appreciate that you can see the cells, you can see their shape, but you certainly cannot see the cell wall or the cell membrane or chromatin inside the cell or ribosomes inside the cell. We just cannot see that level of detail in bacteria under a light microscope. And of course, a lot of the time we don't need to see that because a lot of the work that we do in the microbiology lab every day is we try to identify bacteria. If um, a patient is having symptoms, let's say of a urinary tract infection, and the physician has that patient gather some urine, it comes into the lab. One of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna examine what we call the sediment in that urine. And we're gonna to look to see if there's any microbes in there. And again, by examining certain, um, the, the shape of the cells and things like that, we can make a decent guess what kind of bacteria would be growing inside somebody's bladder. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is identification in the microbiology lab. We're trying to help the physician find out whether there is a, a pathogenic microbe and if there is, what it is. And of course, because we're working with human beings, um, we're talking about bacteria and viruses most of the time. We're not going to see viruses under the light microscope. So most of what we're looking at is bacteria. So Elaine is asking a great question. Is chain formation common to all rod shaped organisms? And the answer is no. Great question. Um, the other thing to know is that all rods don't have the same length or the same width. So some rods are very long and very thin. Other rods are very stubby and sort of fat. And we're gonna see that um, through the semester as we look at different uh, smears. All right, so this is the Bacillus subtilis slide. Here's a good example, take a look at this one. Again, these are rod shaped bacteria and they have taken up that methylene blue stain. Actually, this one might be crystal violet. Hold on just a second, let me double check. Sorry, technology. Yes, this is actually crystal violet. So this is Bacillus subtilis. And this time it's been stained with a slightly different stain. Um, this color is more blue. This color is more purple. I know that's, very, uh, that's a very subtle difference, but methylene blue tends to impart more of a blue color. Crystal violet tends to impart more of a purple color. And that's the stain that's um, present on this smear, crystal violet. Now, again, whoops, when you first look at these, what I want you to do is see if you can find a single cell. 
Here's one right here. Nice rod shaped cell. Here's another one, that's a single cell. But take a look right here, this is two cells. And again, it's hard to see, but there's just the tiniest little white line that, that shows us where one cell ends and the next cell begins. Um, let's see if I can see another chain right here. There's one cell right there. Here's a second cell. Um, let's see where else we can go. Here's two. Here's one cell and a second cell. Now, one of the things that students will say sometimes is, how come these rods are different lengths? So if I look at this one right here, and again, that's a single cell. And then I look at this right here, and that looks much, much shorter. Remember, cells are three-dimensional. So depending on how the cell landed on the slide, we may be looking at it completely along its length, or we may be looking at it more end on. Remember the loaf of bread that I talked about last time. So yes, cells are gonna to appear to have different lengths, rods particularly, are gonna to appear to have different lengths depending on how the cells landed on the smear. But you can really see the general shape of the cells. You can certainly tell that this is a rod shaped bacterium and that it likes to arrange itself into chains. And again, that is sometimes a feature of certain bacteria. And sometimes it can give us a clue as to their identity because we know about some of these arrangement behaviors. Um, Elaine's asking about this end to end formation. Do they always form a chain head to tail like that. That's what we call a chain, Elaine. If we're calling it a chain, we're saying that they're arranging themselves head to tail, end to end. The other thing that cells will do though, is form what we just refer to as a cluster. And that can mean that they're arranging themselves side to side. Um, rods, if they're going to arrange themselves, they often go in chains. We see clustering behavior more often in caucus shaped bacteria. So the round, the circular or spherical type of bacteria, they're more likely to form clusters, although they can also form chains. And we'll see that as well. All right, let's take a look at this next one. Take a look at this one. I wanna point out that this slide and this slide are under the same magnification. This slide is being examined under the oil immersion lens, the 100X lens. So a thousand times magnification. Notice the size of the rods and then look at this one. This is also a thousand times magnification. Look at the size of these rods. They are gigantic. They're huge. Easier to see where one cell ends and another cell begins, right? You can certainly see chaining right here. Look at that. They're lined right up with each other head to tail. See that? This is a different organism. This is not Bacillus subtilis. This is an organism called Bacillus megatherium. You can see where it got its name. Here's the name down here if you're, um, if you're interested. Bacillus megatherium, another rod-shaped organism. These rods can be up to four micrometers long. That's long for a bacterial cell, by the way. Remember, most of the time when we talk about bacteria, we're talking maybe one or two micrometers. These uh, fellas can be uh, about four micrometers long. Now, this is not methylene blue stain. This is not crystal violet stain. 
This is another type of stain. This is called spore stain. Now I want you to notice that in a lot of these cells, there's a central region that has not picked up the purple stain, right? It's, it's maybe pink to your eyes. It maybe looks pink to you, but there is something inside of these rods that is not staining purple. Everybody see that? These are spores. This culture, whoops, this culture is sporulating. Now, there are two genuses, or more properly, genera. There are two genera of bacteria, pathogenic bacteria particularly, that will sporulate. One of them is bacillus, and one of them is clostridium. So that's an important little factoid to know. Two different genuses or genera of bacteria that can sporulate, bacillus and clostridium. So any organism whose first name is bacillus or clostridium is a spore former. Now, there are more spore formers in the bacterial world, but those are the two pathogens. So in other words, there are a lot of bacteria that live out in the soil, that live out in the forest and in the lake and things like that, that can form spores, but they're not pathogens. There are pathogenic bacillus and pathogenic clostridium. So we need to know about those because they are spore, spore formers. Remember, those spores are a form that the bacteria can take in order to protect itself from being destroyed. Sometimes bacteria find themselves in environments that are very hostile to life. The most common cause for sporulation is a dry environment. So if the bacillus or the clostridium finds itself in an environment where the water is drying up, that can trigger it to sporulate. A lack of nutrients can cause sporulation. A buildup of waste products can cause sporulation. In other words, the cell is picking up a signal that says that the environment is deteriorating. And in order to prevent itself from being killed completely, it goes through this very mysterious process called sporulation. It ceases to be a living cell for a while. And it becomes this entity that we call an endospore, or just more simply a spore. A spore is the DNA of the organism surrounded by a very hard, almost impermeable shell. Spores are not cells. They are an inanimate state. It's a fascinating thing if you think about it. That cell can put itself into suspended animation in order to stay alive. It's going to leave its cellular state and it's going to enter into this state of suspended animation. While it's a spore, it's not dividing, it's not metabolizing, it's not consuming nutrients, it's not excreting waste, it's just existing as DNA. And when the environment gets more friendly, when there's more water, when there's more nutrients, when there's less waste in the environment, it will return to the cellular state or what we call the vegetative state. It's a fascinating, fascinating trait that certain bacteria have. But as you can imagine, it makes those pathogens quite dangerous. It makes them hard to kill. Spores by their very nature are very resistant to destruction. It doesn't need to eat. It doesn't need water. It doesn't really need anything. It's just gonna sit there until 
the conditions improve. Spores have been found, for example, in the wrappings around Egyptian mummies. And when you take those spores into the laboratory and you put them into nice, wet, warm conditions, they come back to life. So spores have been investigated as bioweapons. Uh, for example, anthrax. Anthrax is an organism called Bacillus anthracis. And anthrax is a spore former. And unfortunately, um, countries have decided to um, try to weaponize this organism because it is a pathogen. And there have been a couple of fairly recent instances in our country where domestic uh, terrorists have sent uh, anthrax spores through the mail. Um, there was a terrible case several years ago now um, of somebody doing that. Um, and other countries as well have, have tried to weaponize these pathogenic bacteria that can form spores. Because if you think about it, on the battlefield, if you released a whole bunch of spores into the air and you got your enemy to breathe in those spores, their body is nice and warm and wet and full of nutrients. And so the spores will then return to the vegetative state inside the soldier's body and will make them very sick or kill them. The other uh, good example of a pathogenic spore former is the organism that causes tetanus, clostridium, Tetani is the organism that causes the disease we call tetanus. And as you probably know, one of the ways people get tetanus is by stepping on sharp things. And those sharp things are dirty. They are out in the environment. You might step on a stick that penetrates your foot, or you might cut yourself with a rusty nail or a knife or something. And if there were Clostridium tetani spores on that object, they are now embedded into your skin and your flesh. And they can then of course, come back to the vegetative state and cause disease, cause this disease we call tetanus. So yes, those are the two pathogenic spore formers that you should be familiar with. Oh, Carrie, that's a terrible story. Clostridium difficile, uh, also called C. diff in the medical world. Horrific bacterium, horrific pathogen. Um, infects the uh, lower portion of the intestinal tract. And when you get C. diff, if you're unlucky enough to get it, um, it is just a bear to clean up. It really is. It's a bear to get rid of it. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry that um, your child had to go through that very, very hard organism to deal with, especially in hospital settings, yeah. Yes, elderly patients, yes. Well, and part of the reason that Clostridium difficile is such a, a difficult pathogen is because it tends to sort of prey on people who have uh, an immune system that is not quite as strong. So young people, very young people and very old people. In a young person, like a three-year-old, the immune system just isn't old enough yet, it's not mature enough yet to know how to fight off certain pathogens. And in an elderly person, the immune system is starting to break down. So those people are especially vulnerable to those kinds of infections. That's right. All right. So this slide was made from a culture, a pure culture, of Bacillus megatherium in a laboratory. And you might say to yourself, well, gosh, why is it sporulating? I mean, if it's growing in broth, it should have, uh, it has water, it, it has, should have nutrients and so on. I'll tell you what the most common reason 
that a culture, so again, a purposefully grown collection of bacteria, the most common reason that a culture will sporulate like this is because it's getting old. So if I put some Bacillus megatherium into a broth, in a test tube and I grow it, I put it in the incubator and I let it grow. It's gonna be nice and healthy for one or two days. It will start to sporulate after that because the culture is considered old at that point. If you think about it, that tube that has the broth in it, all the nutrients for the bacteria, it's got a limited amount of volume. It's got a limited amount of real estate. And those cells are dividing, they're growing. So what happens after about two days or maybe three is there's so many cells in there now, they are running out of nutrients and there's a lot of waste in the tube now. Bacteria are alive, so just like you and I, they are taking in nutrients and then they're secreting their waste material. So that culture, because it's aging, is getting old. It's, it's running out of the things that those cells need. Now, the way you would deal with that, if you wanted to keep those cells at, in the cellular form, is you would take some of the cells out of that tube and you would put them into some nice fresh broth you'd put them into a nice fresh tube of broth and put them back in the incubator. That's referred to as subculturing. I'm gonna take some out of here. I'm gonna put them into a fresh tube and that will give them fresh nutrients, nice clean environment, and they should stop sporulating at that point. All right. Let's look at the next one here. This slide is just a reminder to us about the different shapes of bacteria. Remember the two most common shapes that you're gonna encounter are the coccus, that's a sphere, and the bacillus or the rod. Those are the two most common shapes of bacteria that you will encounter. We also talk about a vibrio shape or a comma shape. The organism that causes cholera very famously has this comma or this vibrio shape. It's essentially a bent rod or a curved rod. And down here on the bottom, we can see a spirochete and a spirillum. Spirochetes, as you can see, are very long, much longer than a regular rod. And they have a very characteristic twist to them. They have lots of twists. The spirillum is a little bit different, but the differences are subtle. A spirillum shape tends to be shorter than the spirochete, and it tends to have fewer twists and turns in it. Now, if I showed you a slide on a quiz or an exam and you saw a twisty turny looking thing like this and you called it a spirochete and it was really a spirillum, I wouldn't take off points for that because it's difficult to distinguish these two. So you should understand the differences on paper. In other words, spirochetes tend to be longer they tend to have more twists and turns in them than spirilla do. But again, I wouldn't expect you to be able to distinguish these two. That takes a little practice. The other shape you can see on here that is not very common, but I will mention it, is something that's sort of halfway between a coccus and a rod or a bacillus. And that's the coxobacillus. It's just sort of halfway. Some people call this ovoid. This is an ovoid shape. It's longer than a caucus, but shorter than a rod. Not very common. You don't see that one very often. This rod, if it's a, a typical bacterium, is about one to two micrometers long. This caucus is probably a half 
to one micrometer across. All right, take a look at this slide now. On this slide, we're actually looking at a wet mount. So we've gone back to the wet mount for a minute. And all I've done is I put a drop of methylene blue at the edge of the cover slip and I allowed the methylene blue to be pulled under, okay? We are looking at the high dry lens, so the 40X lens. Now, you can definitely see cells on here, absolutely. But I want you to notice that this doesn't look very clean. It doesn't look nice and clean like the smears looked. The background has sort of a grayish color and there are areas where there are large gray pieces of debris on here. Notice that there are these structures like this one here and this one here. These are actually little pieces of fungal hyphae. So this wet mount is not a pure culture that came out of the lab. This is a sample, um, an actual um, sample that um, has multiple organisms in it actually. And because it's a wet mount, because these cells are floating in a fluid from the sample, it just doesn't have that nice, clean, easy to see characteristics that a stained smear would have. Now you can see though bacteria on here, they have taken up the methylene blue. I know it's hard to see, but what you're looking at here are round circular or spherical cells. These are actually cocci. I want you to notice how small they are under the 40X lens. Again, I can see them. I can see bacteria under a 40X lens, but they're very small. I would wanna go up to the 100X lens to see them a little bit better. And that's what I've done here. Now I'm up at the 100X lens. Notice it's just, it's just doesn't, it doesn't look very uh, clean. It doesn't look as easy to see. Here are those big pieces of fungal hyphae. Here's one right here. Here's another one. How do I know they're fungal hyphae? How do I know this isn't a spirillum or a spirochete? I know because it's just too big. It's just too big. Look at the cells though. See how they're circular? They're very circular or spherical again. Remember, they're three-dimensional. This is a coccus. Coccus is the singular form of that word. Cocci is the plural. The background is kind of gray. It's kind of mottled. So wet mount, a wet mount has a certain look to it, right? And it's gonna look very different from a stained smear. A stained smear just has a cleaner look and it's gonna have feature, features that make it easier to examine. Look at this, this is a smear. This is a stained smear. Look at how much more color the cells have taken up. Look at how clean the background is. I've removed the fluid that those cells were floating in. This is a smear on a slide. All that fluid is gone. All the debris is gone. It's just cells that have taken up stain really nicely. Now these cocci are clumping up together. Can you see that? There are individual cells in places on this slide. Um, let's see, where's, this is a good one right there. That's a nice single coccus. Okay, here's another one right here. But a lot of the cells have clumped up together. This is that clustered arrangement I mentioned a minute ago. Some people talk about these as clusters that look like grapes, a cluster of grapes from the supermarket. That's pretty accurate, you know, if you look at something like this, it does. It looks like a cluster of grapes. 
This is a characteristic that several different species that have the caucus shape share. For example, there's a pathogen called Staphylococcus aureus, kind of a, an infamous pathogen called Staph aureus. And Staph aureus likes to cluster like that. Carrie's asking about coccidiosis. It's a great question. So coccidia, coccidia is an organism that is not the same as the coccus shape. So there is an organism whose genus name is coccidia and they are not bacteria. You may have heard of them before. They're especially problematic in veterinary medicine. Most young uh, farm animals get coccidiosis. It's a very, very common problem. Um, so coccidia is the name of an, of an organism. Coccus or cocci is the shape of certain bacteria. Okay, makes sense? <laughs> Good question. Let's jump back in here now. Whoops, a little too quick. Here's the next slide. Ah, a very different color. This is a smear of bacteria. We're looking at it underneath the 100X lens. We have a very different stain here. It has a lovely pink color, a fuchsia color. This is a stain called safranin. This is an organism called staphylococcus. Notice the clustering behavior. Very, very common for Staphylococcus to do this, to cluster up, to group up like this when it's in culture. Now, remember, try to find a single cell. Here's a single cell right here. Over here, I can see two cells side by side. See that? You can really see that these are circular cells. In this little cluster right here, there's one, two, three, four cells. Down here, two or three. Here's four right here, one, two, three, four. Now, if you only looked at this, you might think, oh, those cells are in a chain. But really, most of the arrangements on this slide, on this smear, are clustered arrangements. And that again is a feature that Staphylococcus has in general. This is also a safranin stained slide. We're back to the rod shape now. I want you to notice how fine these rods are. They almost look like hairs. We're under the 1000, uh, the 100X lens again. These rods did not stain very nicely. They look funny. They look unevenly stained. This might be an old culture. Now take a look at this one. This is an organism called Borrelia burgdorferi. How's that for a, a species name? Borrelia burgdorferi, and this sample has been stained with safranin again. We are at 1000x total magnification. Now notice right away the background of this slide. It's not that nice clear white color. And that's because this slide was not made from a pure culture that was growing in the laboratory. This was a patient sample. So some body fluid was taken and a smear was made from that body fluid and then it was stained with the safranin. 
these are the cells right here, all sort of clustered together. So these large looking structures right here. This is a spirochete. Borrelia burgdorferi is very famously a spirochete. So very long, we're talking five or six or maybe seven micrometers long, lots of twists and turns on it, yeah? Very characteristic for a spirochete. Does anybody know what disease Borrelia burgdorferi causes in humans and other animals? Yeah, Carrie's got it. Lyme disease. That's the monster that causes Lyme disease. Spirochete. Oh, Lacey, I'm sorry if you've had Lyme disease. Yeah, it's very common in our area, right? Very, very common. Um, we have to be very vigilant, we New Englanders, about checking ourselves and our children and our animals. We should check everybody once a day for ticks and remove those ticks as soon as we find them. The only good news regarding uh, Lyme disease transmission is it does take a while for the tick to transfer the bacteria to us. They have to be attached to us for the, the current thinking is about 24 hours in order for them to transmit the bacteria. So your best course of action is to check, 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 and get ticks off of you as quickly as you can. All right, this next slide is a spirochete underneath an electron microscope. I love this image because it's just so perfect. It's just so perfect. Look at how beautifully twisted that little cell is. I say little, it's actually a very long cell. So when you're looking at this and you see that the twists don't really look um, orderly, it looks kind of you know misshapen, the twists and turns. Within um, the, the anatomy of the cell are the numerous, numerous twists and turns. So yes, this thing, this whole cell can also bend and twist, but in, in its inside structure, it's got these very regularly spaced out twists and there are numerous, numerous twists. That's very characteristic of a spirochete. If you compare that to a spirillum, a spirillum is much less twisted, okay? The spirilla tend to be more, um, I'll describe them as wavy as opposed to um, very tightly twisted. Somebody uh, once told me that this uh, looks like a ramen noodle, that spirochetes have tight twists like a ramen noodle and spirilla have much looser twists. Can you see that difference? So again, if you looked at this image and you told me these were spirochetes, that would be absolutely fine. It takes practice. You have to look at a lot of slides before you can start to tell the difference between a spirochete and a spirilla. The key thing about those two is that they are twisting and turning shapes, very elongated, much longer than an ordinary rod would be. All right, question. Oh, Elaine's asking a great question. So when an image, when you find an image, say in a textbook, and it'll say it gives a number X, it gives some kind of magnification, right? Usually, and again, this is a general statement, usually they're gonna give you total mag. So any image that says, for example, a thousand X, that's a total magnification. Most of the time when we put an image into a textbook or a journal article, we're gonna show it as total magnification. But what I try to do, because we're students, is I try to talk both about the strength of the objective lens and the total magnification. 
to help us keep thinking that there are two things involved. <laughs> there's the objective lens. And then because of the eyepiece, there's also going to be a total magnification. But yes, most of the time, people who publish images are going to put the total magnification on the image. Good question. Yeah, Connie, I agree. I think the spirochete is um, a lovely thing. I mean, it just looks lovely to me. It's very symmetrical. But of course, we know that Borrelia is a horrible little pathogen that causes a lot of misery in humans and animals. But I agree, it has a beautiful symmetry to it. Um, something you don't get to see very often in nature, that very twisted um, sort of symmetry. All right, we only have a few minutes left. So let's look at a clinical specimen or two. This is a wet mount. This is urine. And this urine has been centrifuged. So technically this is a sediment. Now it's a wet mount, no stain. You can see cells are in here. You can see that they are a certain shape. These are bacteria. We're at a thousand X total magnification. You might look at these and say, oh, maybe those are yeast, but this would be too small to be a yeast under a thousand X. Again, that takes a little practice to get accustomed to that. So if I, if I told you that these are bacteria and I asked what shape they were, you would tell me that that is a coccus shape or that these are cocci. Remember, cocci is the plural of coccus. So yes, this person has bacteria in their urine. Here's another one, also a urine sediment. Can you see them? There's some bacteria in here. This is a wet mount, unstained. Background doesn't look white. It doesn't look pretty because this is not a smear. This is actual body fluid. This is urine. And I think you can see this is a rod shaped cell. Now, if you were to look just at this cell right here, you would be forgiven if you said, oh, that might be a caucus but you have to look all over the slide and you have to remind yourself that cells are three-dimensional. So yes, this looks round, but it's only because we're looking at the cell end on. If you look right here in the center, you can clearly see the elongated rod shape. There's two rods head to tail right there. Here's another rod, here's a rod. So this is a rod shaped organism. This thing right here, that's a piece of debris. This big clumpy thing. Remember, this is a clinical specimen. This is body fluid. There's other material in here. That might even be an epithelial cell or two that have sort of clumped together into the sediment of the urine. Does anybody know? Um, this is a, an unfair question. <laughs> Does anybody know a rod shaped bacterium that sometimes causes urinary tract infections, commonly causes urinary tract infections, a bacterium that has a rod shape? Do you know any bacteria that we commonly find in urine? E. coli, very good. Uh, Lacey, that, uh, you're, you're thinking of Klebsiella. Klebsiella, yes, certainly. And E. coli was the one I was thinking of. But yeah, Klebsiella as well, very good. Yep. See, that's the other thing that we can use as uh, students of microbiology. We can learn the kinds of bacteria that tend to show up in certain places. So there's a certain list that tends to show up in urine when a person has a UTI, or that tends to grow in the intestine, or tends to grow in the lungs. 
So we, we can use that information as well when we try to identify pathogens. Now there's another one I wanna show you just to be complete. This is also from urine. What do you think? We are at 1000X. We are using the 100X objective lens. This is a wet mount of urine sediment or centrifuged urine. You've seen this. What is this? What is that? Yep, a couple of you have it. You saw this just the last time we were together. This is a fungus. You can see both hyphae, those are the branched parts, and you can see yeast budding off of the hyphae. So the circular or oval shaped cell is yeast. Okay, and then we also have the branched structures, the mold structures in here, because fungus, microscopic fungus, can take two forms. It can take a branched multicellular mold form, or it can take a, a circular or oval shaped single cellular form that we call yeast. Now, just to finish up today, that patient does not have a yeast infection in their urine. Mm -mm. That patient is asymptomatic. That patient doesn't have a UTI. That urine was collected as part of their yearly exam. So how come there's fungus in that urine? Doesn't that mean that she has fungus in her bladder? If I find it in her urine, what do you think? Where did that fungus come from? Where did that, that yeast come from? Lacey and uh, Connie, yes. How do we collect urine from, um, from people for a routine exam? How do we collect urine? Do we stick a, a needle into the bladder? <laughs> you can do that, by the way. <laughs> that's called cystocentesis. But no, that's not how we do it, do we? We ask the person to urinate in a cup, whether male or female. We ask them to go into the bathroom and urinate in a cup. Now, we also give them a, a dis, uh, an antiseptic wipe, and we ask them to clean off the area around their urethra but it's very, very easy for people to accidentally get little contaminants into their urine specimen. And those contaminants come from the whole perineal area. The skin around the urethral opening is covered in microbes, bacteria, archaea, fungi. It's very, very common. And of course, in the urogenital region, yeast is also very common on the skin. So yeah, it's very common to find little stray fungi <laughs> in people's urine samples because it accidentally came off of their skin while they were urinating. It doesn't mean they have fungus growing in their bladder. It would actually be very unusual for a person to have fungus growing in their bladder. Remember, bacteria and viruses are the big pathogens. It doesn't mean it's impossible. Fungal infections do occur. It's just not necessarily what's going on. A lot of times it's just contamination. Very good. All right. Any last questions for me before I let you go? Yes, Elaine, clean catch. That's what we call it. We try to get a clean catch urine sample. All right, don't forget you have an exam to take for me today. Yes, you're now ready to finish your lab questions for the rest of the week, whenever you're ready to sit down and do those. I will see you again on Monday morning, 
don't hesitate to message me if you need anything. All right, everybody, have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.